That was really unnecessary, but <laughs> you probably should wait till after I preach. If any applause really goes to God, and I'm not trying to be humble by saying that. It is true. Any applause goes to God for anything good that happens because he's good. Um, when I um, re- retired from being a pastor, uh, I had the same um, concerns too strong of a word, that, that other people who retired from whatever their vocation was had, and that is, what am I going to do with my life? Um, it's really important for those of you who have come to retirement and are retired, it's really important, obviously, to feel like you're doing something meaningful with your life after you retire. If you don't, then you pretty much um, we, we've all been aware of friends maybe even family, who retired. They didn't have anything to do, and their life just seemed to kind of, they just seemed to kind of waste away. They didn't have a, a purpose, um, something they feel like they were making a contribution to the world. Well, for me, um, I'd always done weddings uh, as a pastor, um, anywhere from three to five to maybe nine or ten a year. Usually people in the church or uh, friends of people in the church who are looking for someone to marry them. Um, and so I thought, well, maybe, I, maybe I'll just do a few more of those. And so I've actually become like a full-time wedding officiant. I do that a lot. And so the, one of the benefits of that is I've, I've had a whole new family. For, for um, 29 years, I had the, the privilege of being here. And uh, the church was my family. Uh, this church primarily, but also the larger Christian community in, in, along the Central Coast became my family. And... Um, when I left here, they were still my family in a little maybe different way, but they were still my family. But then I got involved in the wedding industry, like I said, full time. Typically, I would perform, like I said, seven or eight weddings a year here. And all of a sudden, I'm doing 50 and 60 and 70 weddings. And last year, I performed 106 weddings, which is wonderful because I get a chance to meet the best people that I would never meet. I get to share in what is probably to that point the best day in their life. I get to work with other great people in the industry, caterers, photographers, videographers, coordinators, hair and makeup people, uh, florists. And I perform weddings at really extraordinary, beautifully placed, beautiful places. But I feel like I have a whole other family. I have my, my Christian family and I have my wedding industry family, many of whom are not followers of Jesus, many of whom are not believers. And so by the grace of God, I have an opportunity to, to connect with them and speak into their life and be there for them in crisis times and make a deposit of the grace of God and the love of God. And that's really wonderful. Well, one of my friends in the wedding industry, his name is Bob, and he has a granddaughter. And obviously, we know each other not just as an officiant and as a, uh, a coordinator and a videographer. We also over time, have come to know each other's families. And so Bob has a granddaughter, and her name is, her name is, what is her name? Her name is Marion, I think her name is Marion. And he was telling me that um, the other day, they were going someplace, and, and he asked her how she was feeling, and she said she was feeling knighted. And he said, knighted? She said, yeah, I'm kind of nervous and excited, so I feel knighted, she combined the words. And that's the way I feel this morning. I feel knighted. I feel nervous. And I feel excited to be here. I'm grateful to be here. I'm grateful for Pastor Garrett's invitation. I feel very badly for him and, and his family that he, they're struggling with COVID and, and all the other people who are and have prayed for him diligently this week and believe that God is going to take him and his family and restore them to health. And I'm grateful for that. And I'm grateful for this church and all the people who've served here over the years and for all of you. And uh, I want to pray. So we'll do that and then we'll come to God's word. Let's pray. Father, in all the years I stood (laughs) on this platform, um, every Sunday was different. And yet every Sunday there there was at least one common element to every Sunday at least 48 weeks a year for 29 years, there was one common element every Sunday, and that was that people came with expectations. And sometimes those expectations, I think, I I felt like the expectations, expectations were of me, that I needed to preach a great sermon or 
you know, certainly offer people something, namely hope or encouragement or direction or wisdom. Offer them the, the truth of God's word because it provides all of those things. It provides hope and encouragement and direction and wisdom and everything else. Sometimes the expectations, I think, were of the worship team, that they would sing a certain song. or some of, Sometimes the expectations were of the children's ministry or of the youth ministry or some other ministry in the church. And I think secondarily, people had, of course, expectations of God, you know, that they would come and God would do certain things because the reality was those people needed certain things in their life to be done and only God can do them. The people's expectations of me, I think, often went unfulfilled, but their expectations of you never have. And so, Lord, today our expectations are of you alone, not of me. They're not of the worship team. They're not of the children's ministry, although those are important parts of what's, you know, we all have our role to play. But our expectations are of you this morning, that the God who created the universe and orchestrates everything in this world will visit us in the person of his Holy Spirit and minister to the whole person, to the mind, to the body, to the emotions, to the spirit, to the relationships of people that we would walk out of this place better than when we came in, that we would be enlarged, strengthened. Our hearts would be lifted up. Our eyes would be lifted up. I lift my eyes. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord. Amen. Maker of heaven and earth. Glorify your name today. Edify your people. Those are our expectations. And we thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen. I love music. I always have <laughs> loved music. I grew up <laughs> a long time ago. I grew up in the 60s, um, and so I'm still a, a lover of rock and roll. I know that's one of the vices I need the Lord to deliver me from. I, I like music, and, and as, I, as I became a Christian after high school, I became a Christian, uh, and I started seeing the world through the lens of a follower of Jesus, I, I realized that the world expresses their, their passions and their priorities and their desires both in music and I, I felt like in both in music and in, um, well, art, but I was thinking particularly like cartoon strips. I, I loved um, Calvin and Hobbes. Some of you may be familiar with the little boy and his tiger. And if you read, there was a lot of theology in those columns about the world at large and about God's place in it. Very interesting. And of course, music. I grew up when people were singing, Jesus is just all right with me, the Doobie Brothers. And um, there's a bad moon on the rise. Hope you got your life together. Hope you're quite prepared to die. Looks like we're in for nasty weather. There's a bad moon on the rise. There's a lot of theology in that song, believe it or not. And then uh, Woodstock. Um, we've got to get, you know, we're, we've got to get back to the garden. All, all of those songs to me projected this, the human desire to find God in the world or for God to find us. And so music again is reflective of, of where people are at, or what pe where people are at and what they're thinking. And I have a song today. It's not a secular song. Thank God. It's a Christian song. It's a wonderful song by Barlow Girl, who were a couple of sisters, actually three sisters, I believe, and they no longer perform. It's been a few years. But this song really resonated with me, and it ties into the message. And so the lyrics are going to be, um, the lyrics are going to be on the screen as well. So listen to the song, and then we'll come to the Word of God. Show. No, 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 I needed you. 
I'm a really scripted person. All my, all my words on my notes, my notes are right here. So I'm not as, not as gifted as Pastor Garrett to wander from in the, the notes and to keep focused on what exactly he is to say. So I'm going to be pretty much here. Our text is Psalm 10.1. We'll get there in just a moment. They're called the Psalms, which literally means instrumental music are words accompanying the music. But I call them songs for the season because they are songs. Words turn lyrics laid over harmony and melody meant to be sung more than read. You actually should, when you read the songs, you actually should sing them, make up your own tune because that's what the, that's the way it's intended to be. They are songs for the seasons because each one is an anthem, ballad, chorus, hymn, refrain, tune, that was penned in the middle of or at the end of a situation or circumstance in which the author of the psalm found themselves overjoyed, overwhelmed, overwrought, overcome. Found themselves winning or losing, having won or having lost. Found themselves wounded, wearied, wandering, wandering. Found themselves celebrating or commiserating or negotiating. Remember, the Bible says there's a time for everything and there is a time for every event under heaven, Ecclesiastes 3, a time to be born, a time to die, a time to plant, a time to pull out what was planted, a time to kill, a time to heal, a time to tear down, a time to build up, a time to cry, to laugh, to mourn, to dance, to scatter stones, to gather them, to hug, to stop hugging, to start looking, to stop looking, to keep, to throw away, to tear apart, to sew together, to keep quiet, to speak out, to love, hate, war, peace, a time for everything, Ecclesiastes 3, and there's a song for every time, and you could probably write your own, and you probably have, songs for the seasons, you want to celebrate, sing Psalm 9, or 100, or 118, or 145, you want to sorrow, sing Psalm 36, or 51, or 60, you need comfort, sing Psalm 16, or 32, or 77, looking for deliverance, sing Psalm 7, or 59, or 143, repentance, Psalm 6, 6. confused, Psalm 71, worshiping, Psalm 24, jubilant, Psalm 47, defeated, Psalm 60, hopeful, Psalm 21. Do you understand what I'm saying? Every season in life has its song, a song, and you just heard mine. I waited for you today, but you didn't show. No, 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 I needed you today. So where did you go? You told me to call, said you'd be there, and though I haven't seen you, are you still there? I cried out with no reply, and I can't feel you by my side. That's my season, and that's my song for it. And I'm not the first to sing it. David voiced that song in Psalm 10, verse 1. The New International Version reads this way. Why, Lord, do you stand far off? Why do you hide yourself in times of trouble? The New English Translation reads, Why, Lord, do you stand far off? Why do you pay no attention during times of trouble? The Aramaic Bible has it this way, Why, Lord Jehovah, do you stand at a distance and have withdrawn your gaze in times of distress? But I like the message translation. If you got notes this morning, again, I'm a, I'm a note person. If you got notes this morning, I have the message translation on there, which says, God, are you avoiding me? Where are you when I need you? 
Again, that was David's song. At least during this season, he sang others. But at this moment, this is the song he sang. Now, let me give you a quick recap of the entire psalm, and then we'll get back to verse 1, the point I want to make. A quick reading of the entire psalm gives us this overview of its message. The opening line of Psalm 10 reflects the natural frustration we feel in the face of the hardships and heartaches of this world and the evil that pervades it. In our limited understanding, we cannot grasp why God is not intervening right here, right now, in exactly the way that we would prefer. Evil people, we look around and evil people seem to experience success. They actively seek out those who are poor or helpless or weak and take advantage of them. And because of material success, these evil people assume there will never be any consequences for their actions. These people go to great lengths to target unsuspecting and vulnerable people. The same person who might claim God does not exist is also prone to sneer at the idea that God knows or cares about their sin. After verse, those at verse 8 through 11, after that, David prays for God to intervene. He's astonished that some people turn to God and assume he will not, excuse me, turn from God and assumes that he will not judge them for their sins. In contrast, the Lord is aware of the needs of the weak and helpless. And for that reason, David calls on God to disrupt the power of these wicked people and judge them for what they've done. The song ends with praise to God and reassurance of his ultimate victory. Psalm begins with a sense of frustration and anguish. It ends with a hopeful, faithful tone. What God has accomplished for his people produces confidence, a trust that he will hear and act according to his perfect goodness. Again, verse 1. back here. God, are you avoiding me? Where are you when I need you? Has that ever been your song? Have you ever sung those lyrics? Are you singing them now? I cried out with no reply and I can't feel you by my side. God, you're avoiding me. Where are you when I need you? The title of the message is Behind the Scenes, What We Should Think or Do When God Disappears. He never really disappears, I should say, when he seems to disappear. My points are going to be very simple today, actually, just a single point. Because there's only one thing I really want you to hear and remember. I read an article not long ago entitled, Five Reasons People Have Stopped Attending Your Church. And it was focused around millennials. Millennials are a demographic church group or a group of people who follow Generation X. You have the GI generation born from 1900 to 1924, the silent generation from 24 to 45, the boomers born from 46 to 64, Generation X, 65 through 79, the millennials from 80 through 97, Gen, generation Z from 98 to 2012, and then the, young, the newest generation from 2013 on is called Generation Alpha. Each generation experienced a different world than the generation before or after them. Consequently, each generation viewed life differently and lived life differently. You don't have to be a studied in generational issues to know that life in the 1950s was very different from life in the 70s, which again was different from life in the 90s, which again is very different from life today. Anyway, he's saying that millennials and maybe others are not coming to your church, and here are the reasons why, he says. Number one, the church, or they say, the church is irrelevant, the leaders are hypocritical, and fail morally too often. Number two, and this is the point we're going to focus on, God is missing in the church. I don't go because God's missing. I'm supposed to find him there. He's not there. Number three, legitimate doubt is prohibited. Number four, they're not learning about God when they come to the church. Number five, they are not finding community. Again, those are the reasons after his study that the author listed. In a nutshell, people want meaningful relationships. They want experiential knowledge of God. 
They want honest answers to tough questions, even if the answer is, I don't know. They want a real sense of God's presence. And they want people in the church or leaders in the church who, who walk the talk. Now, I believe that people can find those things here. If they'll come, they'll find those things here. Again, I have one point to make. Over the course of my journey with Christ, I've come to discover that when God grows quiet, we grow nervous. Isn't that true? When God grows quiet, we grow nervous. We wonder if he's angry at us. And so he stopped talking to us. I mean, that's what we do sometimes, isn't it? Don't we give our spouse, our friends, the silent treatment? We're mad we don't talk. We'll show them. We just won't talk to them for a while. And we think maybe God does that too. We wonder if he's gone away, intentionally distanced himself from us for some reason. He's moved. He's changed address. We wonder if he'll ever start talking again. Maybe he's tired of speaking and of us not listening. Maybe he's weary of, of, of asking and us not doing what he asks. So he's not speaking or asking anymore. Like I said, when God grows silent, we grow nervous. Thomas Keating said, silence is God's first language. That may be true, but it's not our first language. We are generally uncomfortable with silence. We always have white noise on in the background, right? The, the radio's going, the TV's going, something's going. We just, most people, I've never, I've never, well, I probably have met, I just can't remember them. I'm sure I've met someone who's perfectly comfortable in silence, but I, I really can't remember them. Back, oh my gosh, at least 20, probably 25 years ago, I went to a silent retreat. Our denomination advertised a silent retreat, 72 hours of silence. It was down at San Diego. Now, those of you who know me, and, and some of you do and some of you don't, before my salvation, it's, I know it's hard to believe, I was truly painfully shy transitioned from one community to another the week before high school was to start. And I was comfortable in this first community. It was very much like me, people like me. I, trans I transitioned to another community only about 45 miles away, but it was very different. Um, at that point in my life, I had, I mean, I was very, I mean, I'm not a large person now, but I was very small in stature. I was skinny. I had acne. I had a speech impediment. I was a mess. I was very painfully shy. And over the next few years, through the influence of an, an incredible teacher in my life, one of my teachers in school, who saw something in me I didn't see, and of course the Lord had them see that in me, um, and develop that, I came out of my shell, I became much more confident, and went from a person who hardly spoke at all to a person who wouldn't shut up. Um, in high school, in, I, I guess they still do this, in yearbooks, there's usually a section where it says, you know, most likely, couples, individuals, couples are voted most likely to succeed, uh, you know, best looking, most athletic. Uh, my yearbook, I was voted most likely never to run out of anything to say. I mean, I'm always, so silence was hard for me. But I remember driving down to San Diego, and I, I tried to practice. I'm thinking, I'm supposed to not talk for three days. So I tried to practice on the way down there. Tried to keep the radio off. Tried not to say anything say anything. All my prayers were, you know. So we get there. We get there in the afternoon, late afternoon, and we met for the first time. I think there were probably, everyone there, as far as I know, was a pastor. They weren't all from my denomination, although my denomination sponsored the event. It was at, it was at some kind of uh, Catholic retreat center. And, and, and Catholics, especially, I think, certain branches of monks and priests and nuns are really good at silence. They practice that. They're, they're it's an art. It's an art of worship. It's wonderful. So the place kind of breathed silence. So we get there, and the speaker outlines the next three days. Here's what's going to happen. And, and once this meeting's over, no one's talking. So we're going to eat meals together, but no one's talking. You can walk the grounds, but no one's talking. So for <laughs> three days, we left that meeting, and I'm thinking, I'm not sure this is possible. I'm not sure that no. 
for three days. It was painful at first to not hear anyone, to not hear a voice. You're, you're walking by people, you're looking at them, you're smiling, you're nodding. Nothing. It was a wonderfully encouraging and challenging time, although it was really difficult. God did some things in me when I shut up and just listened and didn't talk for three days. And yet, the reality is most of us are uncomfortable doing that. We, we very seldom turn the volume down or off of our own lives or around us. It's hard for most people to be without words, either listening to them as someone else speaks or else speaking into someone else. We surround ourselves with people talking, even if they're not talking to us. We generally don't like quiet or being quiet, and we don't like it when God's quiet. This is on your notes. The time between the last writing of the Old Testament and the appearance of Christ is known as the intertestamental period because there was no prophetic word from God during that time. It's often referred to as the 400 silent years. The Bible says in Hebrews 1, 1, long ago, God spoke many times and in many ways to our ancestors through the prophets. And now in these final days, he's spoken to us through his son. Long ago, God spoke. In these final days, God spoke. But there was a period, as far as God's children were concerned, that God did not speak for 400 years. And while the truth may be that God was silent, he was not still. He may have been uncommunicative. He was not unproductive. There may have been no words, but there was lots of work. His activity, God's activity, was his language. Jim Hyatt, again, writes on your notes, in biblical history, the approximately 400 years that separate the time of Nehemiah from the birth of Christ are known as the intertestamental period, sometimes called the silent years. They were anything but silent. The events and societal forces of those years would shape the world of the New Testament. And he's right about that. God may not have been talking, as it were, but he was working. We don't have time for a full history lesson this morning, at least not one long enough to cover all the specifics of what God was doing in his world. But we should know that the 400 years of silence corresponded with the reign of the Medo-Persian Medo Empire from 539 to 331 B.C. over most of the known world, an empire that would be a model of future empires in the delegation of power to local governments. That was followed in 330 B.C. by the rise of Alexander the Great and the ascendancy of Greek culture during which the entire world was impacted by Greek law and literature and ideas for governing. Alexander's death at age 25 resulted in the dividing of his kingdom between the Ptolemies of Egypt and the monarchs of Syria, resulting first in Egyptian, then Syrian rule over Judea. The Jews found their independence from Syrians during the Maccabean revolt of 166 B.C. and lived freely for the next 103 years. In 63 B.C., Pompey of Rome conquered Jerusalem, putting all of Judea under Roman control. This eventually led to Herod the Great being made king of the Jews by the Roman Senate. Of course, this would be the nation that taxed and controlled the Jews and eventually executed Jesus on a Roman cross. We'll get back to that in a moment. I have a friend who used to be a puppeteer. And as a teenager, she would travel around with other kids from her church and do skits, dances, mimes, and puppet shows. She said they had this huge stage made of a bunch of PVC pipes and yards of navy blue material for curtains, all held in place by Velcro. She said that most performers don't want the crowd to know what goes on behind the scenes. It ruins the illusion. But she and her team were young and fearless, and at the end of most shows, they'd remove all the curtains from the stage and perform one more skit as if the curtain were still in place. She said the audience would get an eyeful as teenagers worked together to operate their own single puppet, climbing over one another to make the puppet's movements look convincing. And without exception, she said the, 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 the audience would always, she would always hear people say after the show they had no idea it took so much effort to put on a child's puppet show. But it does. It takes an entire cast working behind the scenes to pull it off. As I was writing this message, I thought about that. For the reality is, if we were to catch a glimpse behind the curtain that separates us from the invisible things of the world, we'd see something similar. We would see an entire stage full of players affecting the ins and outs of our world and our lives. And above them all, 
God at work, operating the strings of history, orchestrating the outcome of the drama that he has written. (coughs) My point is that during those 400 years when God seemed to be without words, he was very much at work, making history play out according to his eternal purposes. It was God who brought the Medo-Persian Empire to an end. It was God who raised Alexander to power at age 19, made him great, made him conquer most of the known world and spread Greek custom and culture everywhere. It was God who elevated the dynasties of Egypt, Syria after Alexander's death. It was God who enabled the Jews to free themselves from Syrian oppression. It was God who brought about Roman conquest, dominion, and employed them in the eternal drama of the crucifixion of his sinless son. It was God working. Ephesians 1.11 says, Furthermore, because we are united with Christ, we have received an inheritance from God, for he chose us in advance, and he makes everything work out according to his plan. He chose us in advance, and he makes everything work out according to his plan. The first significant event, well, there might be some argument about this, but I think the first significant event on the church calendar every year is Easter. And the next big event that follows that is Pentecost, the day the church was born. And there are 50 days between the two. 50 days from when Jesus rose from the grave, ascended to heaven, and and then 50 days later, the Holy Spirit descended upon the earth. 50 days. In the hubbub of Easter, we sometimes forget that Jesus stuck around for 40 of those 50 days. Several times during those 40 days, he appeared to different groups of his disciples. He appeared to two disciples near the city of Emmaus and walked them through a study of the Old Testament prophecies about him. He had a private meeting with Peter, of which no details are given. He had a private meeting with his brother James, who would be the first pastor of the Jerusalem church. He appeared to to 11 of his followers in the upper room a week after his resurrection. He appeared to Peter, John, and other disciples near the Sea of Galilee two weeks after the resurrection. He appeared to a crowd of over 500 people at some point during those 40 days. He also spoke to many of his disciples about the Holy Spirit and sent them with instructions to Jerusalem to await the day of Pentecost. After the resurrection, Jesus was talking for 40 days. But then... God grew quiet. For 10 days, while his people were praying and waiting, God said nothing. Once again, he was silent, but he was not still. He was at work behind the curtain. And that is my one loud, lonely point this morning. God was working. God is working always and forever, even if he's not talking to you. He is laboring for you. He is laboring in you. He is laboring through you. Philippians 2.9 reads, For it is God who works in you both to will and do for his good pleasure. Philippians 1.6, which says, Being confident in this very thing, that he who has began a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. I know that we all desperately, sometimes more desperately than others, need to hear God. That's still small voice, any voice. We need to hear God. But if you can't, for any reason, if you can't hear him, you can always see him. You can see his handiwork in creation. You can see his activity among his children. I want you to look on your notes if you have them. The last point, kind of a sub point, says assurance in spite of absence. Hebrews 15, 5, and 6. Now, normally, I don't read the Amplified Bible. I mean, it's too wordy. (laughs) I know what you're thinking. Yeah, talk about wordy. Again, I don't typically read the Amplified Bible, but this case, it says things perfectly. Let your character or moral disposition be free from the love of money, including greed, harvest, lust, and craving for earthly possessions, and be satisfied with your present circumstances and with what you have. For he, God, himself has said, I will not in any way fail you, nor give you up, nor leave you without support. I will not, I will not, I will not in any degree leave you helpless, nor forsake you, nor let you down. Relax my hold on you. Assuredly not. So take comfort and 
so take comfort and are encouraged and confidently and boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I will not be seized with alarm. I will not fear or dread or be terrified. What can man do to me? Did you hear that? God himself has said, I will not in any way fail you, nor give you up, nor leave you without support. I will not. Three times. I will not. I will not. I will not in any degree leave you helpless, nor forsake you, nor let you down, or relax my hold on you. Assuredly not. Remember how my song began this morning, I waited for you today, but you didn't show. No, 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 I need you today, so where did you go? You told me to call, said you'd be there, and though I haven't seen you, are you still there? Here's how it ends. And though I cannot see you, and I can't explain why, such a, such a deep, deep reassurance you've placed in my life. We cannot separate because you're part of me. And though you're invisible, I'll trust the unseen. So I'll hold tight to what I know. So I'll hold tight to what I know. You're here. And I'm never alone. David's message begins like this, began like this, message version. God, are you avoiding me? Where are you when I need you? This is how it concludes in the message version, verses 12 and following. Time to get up, God. Get moving. You know all about it. You won't let us down. You won't let us down. Your grace and order win. Different lyrics, but the same sense, the same truth. God may not always speak, but he always listens. He always works He's always here. God is listening. God is working for. God is, God, God is listening. God is working for. And God is here for you. I wonder what season you're in today. What season are you in? I wonder what song you're singing. No matter the season or the song, one truth suffices. God is at work here. God is at work now. God is at work for and in and with you. Bow, bow your heads for you, would you please? With me. Could we have the worship team come back up? Father, I just thank you for your incredible love for your people. Boundless, immeasurable, unceasing love. I had opportunity to talk to a couple of people this morning, and just from the conversations, I kind of discerned what season they were in, what season they were in emotionally and physically and relationally for people they're concerned about. What I want to do is provide encouragement for your people today, that regardless of the season, even if it's a season when they don't necessarily sense your presence or don't necessarily have not been able to hear your voice or at least clearly, that they'll have the assurance, the confidence, and the knowledge that though you may be quiet, you've not gone anywhere. You're here, present with them, present for them, by the power of your Holy Spirit present in them. I'm not sure what Tim songs Tim gonna, Tim's going to sing or play, but I'm going to just hang up front, uh, out front up here. I'd like to just hang with you and cry with you or pray with you. Or I remember one time I had the privilege of doing this very large uh, funeral memorial service, and uh, there were a lot of non-Christians present, and I, I made sure I inserted the gospel uh, as I delivered the, the eulogy and the message. And at the very end, I said to the folks, I said, uh, um, if, you, if you like something I said today and you want to talk to me, or if you don't like anything I said today and you want to yell at me, I said, I'm open for both conversations. So I'm open for any conversation you'd like to have today. And again, I, church, I'm no one special. I'm, I'm not any different than any of you. We're all saved by grace. We all have the Holy Spirit inside of us. We're all ministers of the gospel on one level or another. But I am your brother in Christ, and I'm more than willing to stand with you and weep with you or laugh with you or pray with you. So again, you don't, you don't have to, 
um, he'll sing a song, and then after that, he'll, he'll release us uh, to enjoy the rest of our day. Love you. Thank you so much for, for coming. Just know that though he may not be talking right now, he's not gone anywhere. He's with you.